Do you ever wonder where your guitar comes from? Now, I'm not talking about the brand. I'm talking about the materials involved in making your guitar. Chances are, if you own an acoustic guitar, you've got a Sitka spruce top that's sourced from someplace. You've got a set of back and sides that are sourced from somewhere else. The fretboard and the headstock veneer could come from somewhere else, let alone the bracing. I mean, I'm talking a ton of different materials from a ton of different places. It's amazing that the guitars are made with such speed that they are in today's modern age. But upon thinking about what guitars are made of, it's a little bit startling to realize that there are so many guitars out there using all of these materials. Doesn't it stress those materials? Well, the answer is absolutely 100% yes, it does. And this has always intrigued me because just recently I was looking at my guitar and I was counting the rings on the top, the, you know, the hard grain lines to see how old the top of my guitar was. And by the time I got from the middle to the edge of the lower bout, the widest part, I think it was on like, it was 175 or 180 years old. That's pretty darn old. And that's when the tree was harvested itself. And you think about, whoa, all of that times, however many guitars are out there in the world right now, it's pretty amazing. But it also revealed a huge gap in my knowledge and understanding of, well, I, I like guitars. I know guitars once they're made, but I don't know what goes into sourcing those materials. So I did a little research and I found a documentary that I think and I really, be, I, I really believe this, that every guitar player, anybody that has ever played an acoustic guitar that likes music needs to watch this documentary. It's called Music Wood. It was released in 2012. And what I love about this documentary is that it specifically uh, looks at three differing perspectives on manageable forest, uh, uh, sustainable forest harvesting, if that's even the right term. I don't know if that's the right term. but. Essentially, this documentary takes the perspective of Sea Alaska, which is in charge of managing the Tongass National Forest, which is where 90% of the spruce utilized in acoustic guitar building comes from. It takes the perspective of Greenpeace, an environmentalist organization, and it takes the perspective of guitar makers. Martin, Taylor, and Gibson all tagged along for this little journey, and some of the footage is truly amazing. It's the type of documentary that you can't unsee what you've watched. When you see an entire forest clear cut and you think, whoa, and then you see what it was once a part of, it's pretty staggering, which is why I want you to watch this documentary. So to give you just a little taste, here's a trailer that I found, and I think you'll be very interested once you watch this. So let's have a look. They said, we've taken a look at what's going on, and if they don't stop and take a deep breath, they're going to cut the last tree in our lifetime. And that caught me up. I was like, what do you mean? It's easy when the supply is endless, and it's hard when the supply reaches its end, and we're at the end of the supply. Even though it's called Tongass National Forest to us, it's our homeland. I will never sleep until I've exercised every possible way to protect this forest. You know, you could do a whole separate documentary on how the United States treated Native Americans. You have the issues of the Klingon and Haida peoples who have been here for you know, thousands of years. And it gets really f You can't uncut those trees. You can always come back and cut them, but you can't uncut them. We are not going to be responsible for the disappearance of music from this earth. So as you can see, you need to see that documentary. And, and seemingly it doesn't seem interesting. It's like, oh cool, a documentary about forestry. 
it goes well beyond that because you really get an in-depth look at how guitar makers are approaching this hot topic. And knowing that if we continue harvesting at the rate that we are, and when I say we, I just mean industry-wide, not just guitar makers, that the last Sitka spruce tree will be cut. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty alarming. And I'm not trying to sound all crazy like environmental like superhero here, but this is just an issue that I think we all need to be aware of. But more importantly, we need to understand the different perspectives. And I think this documentary does a great job at that. Uh, it was, again, released in 2012. Uh, you can rent it on Amazon. That's where I uh, rented it from. I think it was about five bucks. Well worth the five bucks. In fact, I think it's really good for the whole family, to be honest. Uh, just give you perspective on how things are made. And I'll mention this. There's a couple different musicians featured it within the film that I really enjoyed. Uh, one of them was a band called The Antlers, totally unfamiliar with, but really dug what I heard. And also, uh, Khaki King made an, uh, an appearance in that documentary. So I was like, oh, there's a little sonic treat in there as well. So again, check that out. It's the Musicwood documentary. You can learn more about it at AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT110. All right, last week on Acoustic Tuesday, we heard from Brendan and Toby down in Heartbreaker Guitars. They gave us their latest newscast and also gave you an opportunity to win free strings, which I hope some of you cashed in on. We looked at the Orangewood Sage model, we took a deeper dive into the NV Tone model duo, and we listened to finger style champion, I, I'm gonna call him, uh, Manelli Jamal. Uh, this week on Acoustic Tuesday, you already learned about the Music Wood documentary. We're gonna go back to Las Vegas and take a visit from Brendan and Toby and see what their heartbreaker of the month is. I'm gonna sing you a song. Seriously, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna sing you a song. And I hopefully, hopefully it doesn't drive all of you viewers away. I think, I think you'll dig it. It's got an interesting story that I want you to, to hear as well. And you're gonna hear a viewer recommended blues artist that Wow, holy smokes. I've never heard of him before, but you need to hear of him because he's absolutely amazing. All that's coming up right after this. I'm Tony Policastro, and this is the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Guitar geeks, unite. Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode number 110. This is the show where you're gonna learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. Your very best acoustic life, not your very best. Very best sounds like a, uh, like a juice you'd pick up at the supermarket. I'm talking about your very best acoustic life. Now, before we dig into my Guitar Geek list for the week, well, we've got to hit Guitar Geek trivia because it's very important that we expand our knowledge. So here is your question. Folk legend Ramblin' Jack Elliott was born in the year 1931. What was the name on his birth certificate? Was it A, Jack Stephen Reynolds, B, Elliott Raymond Stein, C, James Arthur Varveris, or D, Elliot Charles Adnipos. Go ahead and ponder that, and at the end of the show, I'll be sure to give you the answer. Now, I do have a huge guitar geek list to dig into. In fact, I cannot wait to hit this what do you think question because, gosh, I got something that's really been bothering me lately. But before we dig into that, ladies and gentlemen, accompanying me today and all days on Acoustic Tuesday is, of course, none other than Sir Noah Jacob Heckman Jr. the first. Noah, good morning to you. Tony. Good morning. Happy Acoustic Tuesday to Happy you. Happy Acoustic Tuesday to you. And to all viewers everywhere. Now, you know, talking about tone woods and things like that, Noah, you know, being a guitar player, do you, ever, do you ever look at your guitar and you think, gosh, there's a lot of stuff going on here? Or have you ever had that moment where it was kind of like a, whoa, mind-blowing moment? No. No. <laughs> Just a deadpan no. Does it make you feel guilty that you haven't thought of it? Um... I think it's one, it's a, it's a radar thing. Oh, for sure, for sure. And so it just it was something that wasn't on my radar. Yeah, you know, it just I didn't even in the purchasing process. You know, sure. it's something that doesn't really come up. You know, it especially depends on what also what you're looking for. Absolutely, I absolutely. Came, I came into the guitar world not being not being already a guitar geek. You right, know, I right. was just like, okay, how do I get in? How do I get something that's going to sound good? And how do I do my thing? Right, right. So. Yeah, I no, I was not aware. It's crazy. One more thing on that on that because I I mean honestly I I hadn't either. Um, but once like you said, once it's on your radar, you almost can't ignore it. It's like you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Mm -hmm. Then you know what you know. <laughs> it's just well, I'm even, spouting infinite wisdom today. <laughs> well, even while you were talking about that, I was my mind was going back to Taylor's little documentary. Oh yeah, Bob did when he went 
uh, where was it? Was it South America? He went all over. He went to various continents and really checked in with uh, some leading, um, we'll call them, for lack of a better term, wood industry folks to see how they source their materials, if it's responsibly harvested and things like that. It's fascinating, man. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking of that. So thanks to you and Acoustic Tuesday, it has been put on my radar since <laughs> before today. Yeah, and it's funny because I was like, oh, do you feel guilty? It's like, it's not really something to feel guilty about. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. But uh, one more thing on this documentary that I wanted to mention, and that was Bob Taylor. I think he, he came out, you know, the, the documentary, he just came out as this, this very well-versed individual on these matters. Um, from the, the, the forestry aspect to the building aspect to the sustainability and just his, he has this kind of uh, uh, gray area demeanor, you know, as opposed to, yeah, clear cut it all, we're gonna use all the spruce or don't cut it at all because we can't use anything. He's very much in the middle and I think he takes a really balanced approach. It made me have so much more respect for Bob Taylor and I already had enormous amounts of respect for Bob Taylor. I've had a chance to sit down with him on two separate occasions. Um, and both were mind blowing because he gives you insight into this, these aspects of the industry that you don't really get exposed to on a day to day basis. And he's doing a really good job at helping us become more familiar with this other aspect of the guitar industry, not just what you're holding, but how it actually gets there. And it's pretty staggering. It's pretty awesome. So again, I uh, just, a, just another way for me to double down on you checking out that documentary. I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, speaking of guitar makers, no, I've got a, uh, I've got a what do you think segment here that, that I really can't wait to dig into. Now, if you're new to Acoustic Tuesday, the what do you think segment is a little bit of a tradition we've just started. It was kind of by accident, but boy, it sure has taken off and gives you a chance to chime in on some maybe controversial topics, maybe topics that some people agree on and some people don't. Essentially, I find a video of some controversial topic or something that would pique our guitar geek interest. And I ask you, what do you think? And in doing so, I actually share my thoughts and opinions as well and encourage you to comment below. Now this week, we're gonna have a look at Fender. Now I know this is Acoustic Tuesday, but this was a cross section on two of my interests, right? We had guitar and we had Game of Thrones. And as you know, in April of 2019, or you might not know this, Fender released a series of Game of Thrones signature electric guitars. So let's have a look at them in action and let's talk about it a little bit more. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there you saw Nuno Betancourt, Tom Morello, and Scott Ian just rocking out to the Game of Thrones theme song on these Game of Thrones signature guitars by Fender. Now my question to you and what I want to know is do you think this was a good move or do you think it was just plain weird? Okay, now, now here's my thought. I can get all behind an artist model. I love the Keb Mo Gibson model. I love the Leo Kaki Taylor 12 string that came out. And there's many other artist models that I really enjoy. Uh, in fact, Martin Simpson had a bourgeois guitar for, for a while, uh, for, for uh, some years ago. And I really thought that it was a cool cutaway. Anyways, I digress. That makes sense to me. An awesome guitar player gets, an, gets a signature model built to their specs. Very cool. This seemed really odd to me because I don't think I've watched all the Game of Thrones and let me tell you, I don't even wanna get into the ending because I didn't really dig it and I can't talk about it because Noah hasn't seen it yet. But I don't think I saw a guitar once on Game of Thrones. So to see a whole series of guitars built off of just the sheer popularity of a show seemed really strange to me and I don't quite get it. So I'm left, what do I think? Well, I think uh, question marks. Think of me as a cartoon with a question mark bubble. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. I like Game of Thrones, I like guitars. I don't understand this one. I don't understand this move. Noah, what, what do you think? Well, 
you might be surprised on this one, but I think we agree on this. No way! Yeah. But I'll take it a step further, and, oh, I'll, ju- okay. and I'll just say it. I think it's a novelty okay. that is tied into a way to make some more money. Interesting, interesting viewpoint. I can, agree. Can I, I mean, can I say that? You can. Yeah. And I think, you know, here's the thing. I, I was kind of thinking about how I was going to talk about this because I am all for a guitar that gets somebody into music. And if that's a Game of Thrones guitar and that's their first guitar because they love Game of Thrones and they just wanted to collect this and then all of a sudden they got into playing guitar, more power to you, man. I think that's incredible. I just don't see that. I had a really hard time finding the tie in other than taking advantage of an opportunity of the show's popularity. That's where I'll leave it, but of course, we wanna know what you think, so in the comments below, please let us know. Gamer Th- Game of Thrones guitars, yes or no? Or are you as just as confused as I am? Noah, you have a question, you're raising your hand. I just wanna add one more thing, if yeah. I may. To be fair, we weren't in on the, the whiteboard meeting. True. Where this was discussed about having these Game of Thrones signature models, so, there very well may could be a person who has a passion for wanting to get the guitar into people's hands, like you were saying. Yeah, for and, sure. And this was an amazing segue to get guitar in the hands of people who otherwise may not ever get a guitar in their hands. But then I would think, okay, if that's the case, where, how about the ability to be able to purchase one of these? I was just going to go there. Yeah. We're, we're, we are vibing today okay. All right. um, because I was like, I think these are pretty expensive okay. from what I recall. Putting them out of the reach of somebody that maybe just is getting into guitar. But I don't know. Maybe there's a collective. Maybe it'll convert one person and, hey, you know what? The guitar geek community is better for that. But I'm still left wondering what, why, what, what's happening, what's going on there. Speaking of sustainably harvesting wood and things like that, it seems like there's some more maybe responsible uses. Not trying to dig on Fender, I just, the, the whole concept I have a hard time with. Anyways, please let us know what you think in the comments below. We would love to hear from you, and of course, I'll read some of your thoughts and opinions on a future Acoustic Tuesday show. Moving right along, I think, you know, it's getting kind of chilly here in Montana. I've woken up the last couple of mornings, and I just thought, wow, fall is definitely here. I need to get a little bit, a little bit more warmth in my system before really surging into winter. So let's, why don't you come with me on a trip to Las Vegas? We're gonna go visit Brendan and Toby the Beagle of Heartbreaker Guitars and see what guitar has got their juices pumping this month. So without further ado, here's the Heartbreaker Guitar of the Month from Heartbreaker Guitars. Tony, we are so excited to bring you guys the Heartbreaker of the Month guitar this month. This thing is insane. You know, a lot of guitar players, they're liars. They say, you know what, I don't care about looks. I only care about tone. Wait till you see this guitar. I'm telling you, this thing is, you don't even need to play it, Tony. Just put it on your wall. This thing is gorgeous. Check it out. This is the Dana Bourgeois Large Sound Hole OMC. Dark burst finish over bear claw spruce, DB signature, highly figured mahogany. Open back wave release. That's a zero coat to head facing, ebony bridge, ebony fretboard. Guys, this thing's insane. I know you don't need to play it to appreciate it, but let's go to Mike for a quick demo anyway. Okay, Guitar Geeks, thanks for watching the Heartbreaker of the Month. Back to you, Tony. Now, something tells me, a little birdie told me, a little, little birdie like Tweety Bird, a little birdie told me that that's not the last we'll be seeing that guitar, or hearing it for that matter, because, as you know, in a previous episode of Acoustic Tuesday, I asked, I held up a black guitar case, and I said, what do you think is in here? Well, I actually purchased that guitar. 
um, I went to Vegas some couple weeks ago now and uh, was lucky enough that that guitar was still in stock. I sat down and played it for what was going to be two hours. It turned into roughly four because um, I had to compare it to other models too. Uh, and I was just delighted in it. So I had to take it home. Well, it was shipped to me. Brendan shipped it to me because he's awesome. So uh, the heartbreaker of the month is my heartbreaker of the life of my life. Is that fair? What do you mean, is it fair? Is that really fair to the Acoustic Tuesday viewers to show the heartbreaker of the month that they can't get? Well, if they, all you have to do is come visit me. I'll let you play it. Oh, okay. okay. See, I'm all for everybody trying stuff out. It can still be your heartbreaker. My heart's been broken. And for an additional small fee, <laughs> they can no. play the Courtney Harmon, Hartman no. cannon. <laughs> and what else? Well, Noah, I want to, uh, uh, so I know you're making business plans over there. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to dig into some show comments from Acoustic Tuesday viewers because we've had some great interaction on our comments. In fact, I got two rounds of comments for you today. Uh, a couple of uh, um, little morsels of wisdom are, are tucked away in here. Our first comment comes from Sharon T, also known lovingly as Mama Tack, a fine Tony's Acoustic Challenge member and a model guitar geek for that matter, both her and her husband Dom. Uh, fantastic people who I am honored to call my friends. She started her comment with a hashtag. Hashtag, how to get a new guitar from Whitney. It's a new hashtag, I never saw it before. Do not say the gray hairs are representative of each year you have known her. Just a thought. Uh, Sharon, thank you for keeping me in check on this. Um, as soon as I said that last episode, or two episodes ago, I thought to myself, wow, that is not a good path to pave to try and get a new guitar, is to say to my spouse, hey, these gray hairs are from you. So thank you, Sharon, I appreciate that. Uh, next comment comes from, comes from Neurotic Enigma. I am not 100% certain she hasn't been mentioned, but Annie DeFranco, Annie DeFranco is one of the most awesome singer songwriters who has built her own empire one brick at a time and wields some of Japan's finest handmade acoustics. Annie definitely deserves a spot on the pantheon of Acoustic Tuesday's greatest. Thanks again for all the hard work and time. All hail Sir Noah and Tony's acoustic wizardry. Well, thank you so much for watching and thank you for the artist recommendation. Annie is a, a force to be reckoned with, both on the guitar, as a songwriter, and just as an overall performer and activist, I I think she's an incredible, incredible artist, and a little birdie told me we'll probably be seeing her on a future show. So thank you for that recommendation. The next comment comes from Robert Carhart Jr. He says, first off, Molly Tuttle. There, I've said it, and you probably should too. Also, when I saw Molly Tuttle play in DC earlier this year, she was using an Audio Sprockets Tone Dexter preamp might be worth a review. In fact, you're not the first person to tell me about this, Robert. Uh, a couple of different people have recommended this to me, so it's on my list of things to seek out for a review, and I'm excited to dig into it when I do indeed get it. So thank you for watching, and thank you for the comment. Our next comment comes from Pat Cross. In reference to an artist we featured uh, a couple episodes ago on Acoustic Tuesday, Willie Watson. He says, I first saw Willie Watson playing with the David Rawlings machine. The first time with John Paul Jones. In fact, I saw him with the Dave Rawlings machine twice and saw him solo at Grand Targi a few years ago. Don't miss him if you get a chance. I have this denim jacket I've had since the 70s. Like you, I have a hard time figuring out how slash when to wear the thing. Well, thank you for the validation on Willie Watson and also the denim validation. Certainly appreciate that. And our last comment from this round comes from Davy Joe W in regard to the world's angriest guitar player. Now, you may have recalled that we asked, what do you think about the world's angriest guitar player? Well, Davy Joe has some thoughts. He would do well to join up with Tony's Acoustic Challenge. Man, might need to sober up, sober up a tad first. Great show as always, Davy Joe in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for your comments. Certainly appreciate uh, you watching, certainly appreciate the interaction and for everybody that leaves comments, we love it. We love hearing from you and of course, uh, it helps us further our Acoustic Guitar Geek discussion. Now, coming up, I've got an artist you need to hear that came from a recommendation from one of our very own viewers. We gotta dig into the mailbag and I think their tables have turned in this little mailbag section. And of course I have your trivia answer, but first I'd love to sit down and play a song for you. Yes, it's been a while. And uh, one of the things I encourage every acoustic guitar geek to do is to play every day. So in honor of that, I thought, well, I should sit down and share one of my tunes with the fine folks 
that watch Acoustic Tuesday. So I'm gonna do that very thing. In fact, I'm gonna have you listen to a portion of the tune, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story on how it was written, when it was recorded, and actually when it's gonna become available. So without further ado, here is my original tune called Take My Heart. I hope you're still watching. I uh, hope you enjoy that. <laughs> I don't normally sing a whole bunch, but this was, uh, this was actually one of the first songs I ever wrote. I wrote it some years ago, and uh, ironically, it's, a, it's actually a love song. It's not a bummer song, although it sounds like a bummer song. I can assure you it's a love song. And I wrote it uh, in, in one single evening. I kind of sat down. I had this old, it's a 1926, um, uh, what is it? It's a size 2. 17. It's an old Martin guitar, 12 fret, slotted headstock, real small body. And I was just messing around and all of a sudden the lyrics just came and there it was. And it was about, you know, falling in love and like, you know, whatever, 
all the details. But anyways, so I finally recorded it. Well, I recorded it once before with my good friend Shelly. Uh, that's out on an album. We do a, a duo performance of that. And uh, that album is entitled Half Broke Horse. You can find it on Spotify and all the, all the digital stuff. But I just re-recorded it as purely solo, and I used that very Mule Resophonic guitar for it. And I'm releasing that, I want to say it's going to happen in December. You never know how long it takes vinyl to get pressed, but seemingly the date keeps getting pushed out further and further and further. But I'm hoping that by the end of the year, I'll have a new album to share with you all, and that song will certainly be on it. So thank you for listening. And to see that whole performance, please go to AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT110. All right, Noah. There were so many comments on the episode 107. Mm-hmm. I want to dig back in. Okay. Uh, because actually one of our viewers brought up something that is very important, a free festival that you all can attend. Uh, and I'm going to get to that. But let me dig into the comments here real quick. Uh, Richard Lang says this. And this is in regards to a question that was posed by one of our viewers saying, hey, is a $10,000 guitar really worth that much more or that much better than a $2,000 guitar? And he has a very, Richard has a very succinct way of addressing that question. He says, money doesn't define a guitar's value. How you feel when you play it does. Don't fall into the trap that because it costs more, it must be better. It's simply not true. And I think a lot of us can agree. It's about how you feel. It could be a $3 guitar, but if it makes you feel amazing, it may as well be a million dollar guitar. Next comment comes from Gordon R. He said, hey, great issue of Tone Quest, usually electric oriented. I'm assuming that's a, a, either a video or a publication. I'm not sure I didn't do enough digging on that. Uh, he says, the current issue is completely acoustic with pickup reviews and more on the Tone Dexter, which is a really interesting acoustic preamp. So it sounds like Robert and Gordon got together and teamed up and said, hey, let's nail Tony down on this Tone Dexter preamp. Um, so I will be looking into that, I promise you all. In fact, my dad is even hit me up about the Tone Dexter. So. I'll, we'll see. We'll see what I can do. He says this. Oh, and this was cool because I posed a question to everybody. I said, hey, you know, humidity is important. I love the Bovida uh, humidipacks, but I'm not sure how they travel, meaning I don't know if you can get a humidipack through airport security because I guess technically it's a liquid. So check this out. Gordon actually answered the question. He said, I saw a humidipack tossed out by TSA yesterday in the Denver airport. I hate security there, always really crowded. The guy was on my flight and he had a GS Mini that had seen a lot of miles. I asked and he travels for work and hasn't had any problems with flying. His guitar ended up in first class cabin as we were both in the back of the plane. I just wondered what they had to move to put it in the overhead. I still travel with my Ferk fold-up guitar, the Little Jane model, but I always want to bring something better. Thanks from Cincinnati, Gordon. Well, thanks for watching, Gordon, and of course, thanks for the little tidbit there about the Humidipax and the Tone Dexter preamp. Our next comment, actually, Small Win, comes from Russ H. He says, Small Win, got my Tommy Manual tickets for Santa Cruz on December 9th. Can't wait. Also, Small Win for Tommy, he is now a U.S. citizen. Well, for a few months now, but that's great. Shout out to all the AT and TAC peeps from Newark, California. Lastly, found a great new bourbon distilled by none other than Bob Dylan called What Else But Heaven's Door. Some of the proceeds go to healthcare for musicians in need via the Music Health Alliance. Cool tidbit and congratulations on the small win, Russ. That's so awesome. Seeing Tommy Emanuel in concert is absolutely astounding. It's a life-changing experience, dare I say that. And our last comment, more of a statement and more of a a way to get all of us guitar geeks in the know. One of our very own viewers is looking out for, the, our, for our guitar geek, uh, um, what's the right word I'm looking for? We're, one of our very own viewers is looking out for our success in our guitar journeys. And this comes from Vic G, who is a wonderful Tony's Acoustic Challenge member, a fantastic guitar geek, and just somebody that has his finger on the pulse all the time. And he sent in an email to support because he was frazzled. We were gonna miss this, but Vic, I got your back, and I've got all of our Guitar Geek backs. He says, would you mind passing this on to Noah and Tony? I meant to submit this to the Acoustic Tuesday website a couple of weeks ago, but forgot. I'm probably too late to get this on their lineup for any of the shows that are in the can currently, but maybe they can edit it in a mention on an upcoming episode. I think this is too big of an event to not at least have a mention in an Acoustic Tuesday episode. Well, Vic, I'll tell you this, you're right in the nick of time, because it's October 1st today, and this festival starts tomorrow. 
Oh, and it's free, so you don't need to get tickets. Here we go. Coming up the weekend of October 2nd through the 4th in San Francisco is the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival. This is a major annual event in San Francisco at the end of September slash beginning of October timeframe. This is a free weekend long festival in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. It has well over 50 acts, 78 this year spread out on multiple stages with simultaneous concerts running throughout the entire weekend. Just some of the artists featured in 2019 include Caitlin Canney, Chris Thiele, The Milk Carton Kids, Tanya Tucker, Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley, Sierra Hall, Emmy Lou Harris, Joan Osmore, Judy Collins, Mandolin Orange, The Punch Brothers, and so many more. So I wanna thank Vic for that because I wouldn't have even known about it. It would have just went right past my radar. And hopefully some of you, at least maybe even one of you, will go to that concert or that festival and have the time of your life, find a new artist and just enjoy acoustic music. So thank you, Vic, and thank you to everybody who commented. All right, coming up, I've got some guitar signals for you. And I'm super excited to share these because these are some pretty large guitar signals. There's a lot, a lot of good stories here. So without further ado, let's just dig right in. That might be my third without further ado today, Noah. I'm not keeping track anymore. You're not? Nope. Did I break the little ticker that you were using? I just, I decided that, you know, I accept you for who you are. With your further adieus and all. Thanks, man. I certainly appreciate that. Our first guitar signal comes from Don L., also known as Daddy O307 here on YouTube, uh, from Chicago, Illinois. He says, greetings, Tony and Noah from the Windy City. This may be too late to make episode 100, but I've been dying to do this forever. This is my little pride of guitars. For the last few years, and all save one were collected in the last three years. My emphasis in collecting has been twofold, owning a wide variety of things and getting them at a very good deal. Case in point, all six string electrics cost me under a grand for all. I can't afford high-end guitars, but I'm fiercely proud of what I have, starting from the back left sofa top to the bottom right. Here are the stats. A Washburn BT-8 electric, a Washburn WI-64, a Carvin Bolt Strat, a Squire Custom Vibe Test, a PV Generation EXP Tele, a Yamaha BB300 bass, a Stenzler ZZ Rider Electric, an Alvarez ABT60E Baritone, Strindberg Round Neck Resonator, Breedlove Stage C25, Alvarez AP70 Parlor, Dean Backwood Six String Banjo, Alvarez RDS S12 12 String, Ibanez AEW Series Cordia Back and Sides, a 1970s Yamaha FG75, an Eastwood E60ME Limited Edition number 48 out of 100 made. Now check this out. The oldest and most precious of them all is the one I'm holding, a 1983 Taylor 710, which I bought new after my very dear departed 74 Guild D50 was stolen from me. This was far before Taylor ever developed their signature orchestra body design. In fact, I showed a picture of it to Bob Taylor and he confirmed that he was probably on the line making it at the time. Sweet. Lastly, on the table, I included three things that were, my, that, were made, that were family made. The dulcimer is modeled after a prophet style and made by my dad in 1972. The violin on the left was made by my paternal grandpa in 1917, one year before my dad was born. After it fell apart in disrepair, my dad rebuilt it in 1962. On the right is the violin my dad made from scratch in 1963, making everything except the metal parts, including the varnish. Though both my dad and grandpa dabbled in woodworking, neither was a luthier or instrument maker of any sorts. Just a note to the new generation of viewers and guitar geeks out there. This was far before being able to access any building information on YouTube or anywhere else on the web. You had to go to your local library. What is that, you may ask? Or as my dad probably did, went to Lion and Healy, which was Chicago's largest musical instrument store at the time, and ask for information about violin building. And very lastly, but oh so important, is my personally designed coffee mug. I took pictures of most of my acoustics on the rug you see before you, then I stylized them in Photoshop and created a mug online. I'm a beer drinker, and the only other brown beverage I can handle is copious amounts of black coffee. Thank you so much for everything you all do for the acoustic guitar community. I have not only watched AT from the start, I probably saw every review Tony ever did at Music Villa 2. The best of luck with EP100 and far beyond. Keep on strumming and picking. Oh, and there's one more picture. Yesterday, I finally submitted my guitar signal photo. As I was lugging all those guitars back upstairs, I was aghast and horrified to realize that not only had I forgotten one, but it was my number two dread, the one I go to for live performances. Needless to say, my Alvarez 8070 was pretty pissed as well. I had to make sure I took a picture and submitted it today or else I'd never hear the end of it. Thanks. 
All right, well, thank you for submitting your guitar signal and of course the accompanying stories. Next up, we go down to Cary, North Carolina to see Jim Duggan's guitar signal. From the left of the photo, a 1968 Guild D25 Lanakai tenor uke, a Mexican Fender Strat, a 1971 dulcimer from Asheville, North Carolina, a 1927 Winster tenor banjo, a lower mandolin, a 1928 Regal tenor guitar, a Taylor GS Mini, Molokai tenor uke, 2015 Guild M20, 2011 Martin D35, and then here we go to the story. Sorry, I was in my, my um, uh, what do they call that? Auctioneer mode. The Winston and the Regal were bought new by my grandfather. I bought the D25, D25 new when I was in college. Maybe room for one more? Well, I, I think there is, Jim. I think there certainly is always room for one more. In fact, that is the equation that we should all remember. The, um, the guitar, what, what's the equation? How many guitars do you have? It's like what I have currently plus one. Or maybe that's how many guitars you need. Do you remember the equation, Noah? Uh, no. But, I, but the whole, there's always room for one more. Yeah. I've always been that way about kids. <laughs> about kids? Yeah. <laughs> that was, <laughs> there's always room for one more. Coming from the guy who has six of them, I mean... I uh, yeah. He 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 practices what he preaches. What can I say, folks? He's he's an he, and he's he's a bare, apparently twelve years old. <laughs> You're young. You look young. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, moving on. Uh, we're, so we're done with the guitar snows. I wanted to, to mention that if you have a guitar snow that you want to see featured on the Acoustic Tuesday show, it's super easy. All you have to do is get yourself a guitar snow shirt. There's a link right beneath this YouTube episode. Once you get that shirt, put it on, take a picture amongst all of your guitars, and then submit it at AcousticLife.tv. Once you go there, there's a submit link in the top menu. Click on it. You can upload your photo and then go ahead and describe your guitar snow. And please include any stories that some of the guitars may have attached to them. It's always cool to hear that. And also one more important item of business is that we're in the middle of an enormous fundraiser for Guitars for Vets. And this is a fundraiser that will reach a fever pitch on November 11th. Yes, November 11th, mark your calendar. We're gonna do a special edition of Acoustic Tuesday, a live edition where we will be doing performances, where we will be doing interviews, and more importantly, we will be fundraising our butts off for the Guitars for Vets organization, trying to reach our goal of $100,000. And we cannot do this without your help. And there's four ways you can help. And you can find them all at at, the number four, vets.com. Go to at4vets.com. You can make a monetary donation for Guitars for Vets. You can purchase Acoustic Tuesday for Vets merchandise, which actually, I just saw what Noah was wearing today, and I said, hey, dude, that's a nice shirt, because, well, it's an Acoustic Tuesday for Vets shirt. You can also recommend that we reach out to a music industry company, because we're not limiting this fundraising just for us guitar geeks that enjoy guitars and gear and things like that. We want to reach out to the folks that make the guitars and make the gear. In fact, we've been having wonderful, wonderful support. In fact, so far, we've got Bourgeois who donated. We've got Jason Costel who makes amazing guitars. He donated. We've got uh, Eddie's Guitars in St. Louis, Heartbreaker Guitars uh, down in Las Vegas. Santa Cruz Guitars helped out by donating a, donating a, tar, a guitar that we raffled off during the Acoustic Life Festival uh, back in June. So. We're really getting wonderful support from the industry and we wanna continue that. So if there's somebody that we need to reach out to, please let us know in the comments or go ahead and send us a message. And then the last thing you can do to help out is if you know if it's not in the cards to make a donation or buy a shirt right now, that's fine. Please share this fundraiser because just by you sharing it helps spread the word and that's what we want. We want everybody to know about this fundraiser. I wanna walk down the street and have somebody tell me, hey, have you heard about the Guitars for Vets fundraiser that Acoustic Tuesday and Acoustic Life is doing? That's, that's the kind of level I want this to reach. So with your help, we can certainly do that. So pick one of those ways and help us out if you can. All right, moving right along. Noah, can we dig into the mailbag? Sure. You seem kind of excited. You sure. seem mildly excited about this part sure. today. Sure. You want to dig into the mailbag? I'd love to dig into the mailbag. Um, I got it. some things. Got some things. I got... Um, First of all, I'm going to show off the goods and then I'll read the accompanying letter. I got uh, So Good Hot Sauce, Mango Thai Pepper. Mm. Got that. And I got some So Good Peanut Curry. All right, check that out. Now, there's an interesting story. Now, you got a bottle of each as well. I did. That kind of 
Did I steal your thunder a little bit? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay. But I mean, <laughs> I mean we got the same thing. You know? Well, well, check this out. So these these uh, uh, hot sauces come from um, one of our members, a Tony's Acoustic Challenge member by the name of Fernando, who actually won himself a Martin Triple O eighteen by participating in the Thirty Days to Play Challenge. Thirty Days to Play is a place where beginners can go and learn all they need to know about guitar, and most importantly, have fun. So Fernando won this contest, and uh, he he sent us these as thank yous, and also uh, included a letter. So here it is. I'm going to read it in its entirety because it's a cool story. Hello, Tony and Noah. I want to begin by thanking you for providing an all-around guitar an all-around guitar service, which includes TAC, Tony's Acoustic Challenge, Acoustic Tuesday, the monthly guitar party, and guitars for vets. At times when I feel down and I and out, or even out of place, I know that I can turn to my guitars and find peace. Side note, notice I mentioned guitars. <laughs> Since receiving the Martin Triple O 18, which I named Amberbach, beer, naturally, I have tuned the Martin to DAD F sharp AD, and I keep my first guitar tuned to standard, which is a black Fender named Imperial Stout. Again, beer. Beer geek here. Tuning them differently really adds variety to my guitar journey. Enclosed are my two amazing sauces, recipe and business card. So not only did we get these, but we got the recipe to make them, which is so cool. Uh, first, So Good Chef Mango Thai Pepper Hot Sauce. This is not your ordinary red vinegar hot sauce. I went after a flavorful profile that added the right amount of heat without overdoing it. This hot makes you want more and more. When I owned my restaurant, So Good Cottage Cafe, I used to serve it with my locally famous key lime pie. May sound strange, however, the curry in the hot sauce complements the key lime perfectly. And then second, the So Good Chef peanut curry sauce. This sauce took me seven years to perfect. Let me tell, well worth the sweat and tears that went into it. This sauce became my number one seller at my restaurant. I served it in a 14-inch spinach wrap with chicken, rice, and vegetables pressed in a panini. Hungry yet? This ready-made sauce is great for stir-fry over rice, barbecuing, sautéing over pasta, dipping, and even pouring a bit over vanilla or coconut ice cream. Again, another way served at the restaurant. Both sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, and preservative-free. Notice the natural separation. Shake well and use. Once open, date the peanut sauce and refrigerate. Peanut sauce will keep in the refrigerator for three months. Hot sauce will keep up to a year in the refrigerator once opened. Enjoy, Fernando M. Well, thank you, Fernando, and we will certainly be enjoying it. Now, you've got my curiosity peaked here because I'm gonna try these with ice cream. At your recommendation, and I'll report, I promise, I will report uh, to see what, what the, the results are. Now, Noah, hmm. uh, something tells me you got something up your sleeve here because this is usually when I ask you if you've received any mail, and mm. usually the response is a no, but just judging by that little grin you got, I think you've got another story to tell here today. Well, yeah, I was a little excited about it. <laughs> and so maybe I kind of mentioned something to you before about it. But well, yes, I did get something. I got a card in the mail addressed to me. Shall I read it? It was a vehicle renewal, renewal notice. <laughs> Yay. No, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. <laughs> no, I do that online. <laughs> Okay, this comes from uh, a longtime Tony's Acoustic Challenge member, uh, Acoustic Life Festival attendee, and just all around good chap, uh, Dr. Dave B. He might be the leading uh, package sender. Yes, you might. That might be true. I, I you think might. It uh, is. Well, next to your dad. True. Good point. Okay, or is that really your mom? Uh, no, judging by the packaging, it's probably my dad, because he just tapes the hell out of it. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So, let me read the highlights here, okay? It's addressed, uh, Sir, Sir Noah, Jacob Heckman Jr., the first. Often, Tony gets to gloat during the mailbag section of AT. That excited me. That line excited me. I, it went down a little bit on the second line, but that's okay. He says, you won't be empty-handed when... The rare eagle of good spirits, we're talking single malt, not eagle rare, flies into Bozeman, Montana with a little spirit selected especially for you. I ordered a preview of Virginia Distillery's Prelude, Courage, and Conviction, their mm -hmm. first ever release of a single malt distilled in Virginia. Oh. I learned about it while visiting there on August 26, but they're not releasing it until September 1st, so I've not had a chance to taste it myself yet. But their third-party shipper says that online orders will start shipping somewhere mid to late October. 
By the time you receive it, you might be needing some antifreeze to keep your blood moving on those cool <laughs> Montana evenings. <laughs> Cheers, Noah, and the best to everyone else at TAC, Dr. Dave. That's awesome. I will, I, and I will share the whiskey with you, too. I might have some. I might have some. It's yours. <laughs> well, let's, let's dig into what we're listening to this week. Uh, this week, the Artist of the Week comes by recommendation from Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, by Acoustic Tuesday viewer Byron N. And he says this, very emphatically, if Kerry Morin hasn't been already nominated or even featured, I'd be surprised. Well, I was surprised too, because after I heard Kerry's music, I was blown away. Uh, he just drives some great sounding blues. And this song demonstrates that he's a guitar geek, like the rest of us. Found him on Spotify as a similar artist to Laser Lloyd, another guitar geek that I've had the privilege to meet and see perform as well. Anyway, stuck at home on a Sunday trying to crank through some work I'm behind on. And thank goodness for the Acoustic Tuesday playlist on Spotify. It'll get me through. Thanks, guys. You're awesome. Well, you are awesome for recommending Carrie Morin. I had never heard of Carrie. Um, didn't know anything about him. And then I dug into some songs and I was like, okay, this is somebody I need to know. So let's all get on the same page and listen to Carrie Morin's song, Old Guitar. Here it is. See what I mean? He just has, and Byron was was totally dead on when he said he just drives some great sounding blues. Between the voice and the guitar playing, it's really just this, it's this thumpy, if your foot's not tapping, it, you, you are not listening to Carrie. Plain and simple. Uh, I was blown away. I, I really was. I, in fact, I was listening to him coming back from, um, I was driving back from Belgrade on the way home from a gig uh, last week. And I had it absolutely cranked in my uh, in my car, and I was just digging the fact that this felt like new blues music, but it felt like from a bygone era. Like he could have very well been a Delta blues musician that was just lost in the shuffle and all of a sudden rediscovered. But he's he's a new newish artist, so it's pretty cool when you find music like that. Uh, let's have a listen to another song. This is a, a tune called "When I Rise." So let, here it is. Early in the morning Baby, that's when I rise Early in the morning Baby, I gotta run What I tell my children All right, in fact, that was one of the tunes that I was blaring in my car. I got home from the gig and uh, Whitney was like, yeah, you're home, I could hear you as soon as you pulled up. So I don't think I won points with that one because you know, when my gig was over, I think I pulled in the driveway at about 11.30, she was sleeping, she heard the car, she woke up. Sorry, Whitney, I really love you to pieces. I just was digging the music. Anyways, let's listen to one more tune uh, just so you can get the full scope of what Kerry Morin is all about. And here is his tune, Cradle to the Grave. Watch over me So now you've got the Carrie Morin appetizer, the main course, and dessert. You probably love his music. And if that's the case, let me tell you what albums to get, or at least which albums to start on. First, we got Tiny Town, which I thought was a fun album name. Uh, next, Cradle to the Grave. And then finally, When I Rise. Awesome albums. The one I've really been digging into is Cradle to the Grave. Um, I just... I don't know, I, I find myself gravitating towards that particular album. I don't know if it's the artwork or the photography on the front. I don't know, I love it. 
So I'll just leave it at that. To learn more about Carrie and to see those full performances, go to acousticlife.tv forward slash AT110. Noah, we've almost done it. We're almost to the end. What does that mean? What do you mean, what does that mean? We're almost to the end of the episode. What else could it mean? Well, you said it like What else you, could we have done? You said it like you had something else you were going to say. Well, yeah, I was going to say we have to do our Guitar Geek trivia still. Oh. Is that okay with you? Yes. You seem bothered. <laughs> Are you still mad that the whiskey didn't come no, with the card? No, no, okay, no. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm really looking forward to, to share. We should share that together on a future episode. I will gladly, okay. gladly. Just because it's an Acoustic Tuesday and, sanctioned event. And I hear you talking about the artists and things too. And sometimes I get lost in my thoughts about what you're saying. And mm. that triggers other thoughts of artists and other things. And I can get a little distracted. I'm sorry. Well, it's crazy because we were talking about Carrie. And I just, I look at Carrie. Like if I saw a picture of Carrie before I heard him sing, there's no way I would peg that dude for that voice. I just, I just wouldn't. Yeah. And I wouldn't even peg that guitar style. I mean, not that you can say that by the way someone looks is how they play but you know you kind of have these preconceived notions no i he, agree he's he probably totally... he's probably number two one number one for me is probably still coulter wall oh okay when okay. first hearing him like the unassuming look and then you hear him and you're like what well see for me <laughs> i heard him first before i saw him oh that's right yeah 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 and so but anyways yeah Okay, well, moving. Okay. Let's let's wrap up. Let's bring the Guitar Geek trivia open loop to a close here. Uh, just a quick re re um, reading of the question here. Folk legend Ramblin' Jack Elliot was born in the year 1931. What was the name on his birth certificate? Was it A. Jack Stephen Reynolds, B. Elliot Raymond Stein, C. James Arthur Varvaris, or D. Elliot Charles Adnapos? Well, if you answer D. Elliot Charles Adnapos, you are 100% correct. Elliot was born in 1931 in Brooklyn, New York, the son of Florence and Abraham Adnipos. He attended Midwood High School in Brooklyn and graduated in 1949. Elliot grew up inspired by the rodeos at Madison Square Garden and wanted to be a cowboy. Encouraged instead to follow his father's example and become a surgeon, Elliot rebelled, running away from home at the age of 15, to join Colonel Jim Askew's rodeo, the only rodeo east of the Mississippi. They traveled throughout the mid-Atlantic states and New England. He was only with them for three months before his parents tracked him down and had him sent back home. But Elliot was exposed to his first singing cowboy, Brammer Rogers, a rodeo clown who played guitar and five-string banjo, sang songs, and recited poetry. Back home, Elliot taught himself guitar and started busking for a living. Eventually, he got together with Woody Guthrie and stayed with him as an admirer and student. Elliot's nickname comes not from his traveling habits, but rather the countless stories he relates before answering the simplest of questions. Folk singer Odetta claimed that her mother gave him the name, remarking, Oh, Jack Elliot, yeah, he can sure ramble on. So there you have it, a little bit of folk trivia, folklore, folk, folk mythology, if you will, and another Guitar Geek trivia feather you can add to your cap if you have that. It feels good to know things. I'm a trivia, I'm just a trivia junkie. In fact, whenever anybody comes over and asks to play a board game, I insist that it's trivia because it makes me feel good. It's, it's less a game of chance and more a game of knowledge. I digress. Let's wrap up the show. And luckily, one of our very own Acoustic Tuesday viewers bailed me out. Ricky K wrote the show's ending for me today. He says, since you're always doing a, quote, deep dive, you've put your Speedo on. You've climbed up the ladder to the 10-meter platform. You've walked to the edge and turned around, keeping only your toes on that platform. You've launched yourself into the air doing a back two and a half somersault with two and a half twists, cutting smoothly into the water to take the gold medal that is Acoustic Tuesday. That's brilliant. That's, that's purely brilliant. I think he gets a gold too. I agree, I agree. Now, picturing the bearded Harry Tony in a Speedo doing a, a you know, I wasn't, somersault. I and, wasn't until oh. you just said it. Yeah. So thank you for that, Tony. <laughs> It would just like look like Bigfoot falling off a big high platform. <laughs> Anyways, I want to thank you, Ricky K, for um, writing the show's ending. We certainly appreciate that. And if you have any show endings that you would like to see read, I'll go ahead and read, uh, put those in the comments, and I'll uh, try my best to read them on a future episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Let's take a quick sneak peek into next week and see what's going to happen on Acoustic Tuesday. We're going to listen to a Red Hot Folk Trio. 
We're gonna learn about a guitar named after a Canadian migratory bird. I forgot that I wrote that. I actually am trying to figure out which bird that is right now. I can't, I can't remember, but you'll have to tune in next week and I guess I'll find out next week. And a book that gives you the real scoop behind one of the most famous songs in history. And it's not as rosy of a picture that's presented. You're gonna have to tune in next week to figure out what song it is and what book I'm talking about. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We appreciate you sharing your time with us. We appreciate you being a guitar geek. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. And for your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, just visit AcousticLife.tv where you can do a deep dive and you don't have to have a Speedo on for it. You can do a deep dive on anything I've ever talked about on Acoustic Tuesday. Again, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your time with us. And remember, Guitar Geeks Unite.